What's the difference between phase and polarity? These terms often get used interchangeably and often in the wrong way, and they're pretty similar, but not quite. So how do you tell the difference and why does it matter? Today, I'm gonna uncover all the mysteries so you won't have to wonder anymore and you can solve your problems faster because you're using the right words. To get it right, we've got to start at the beginning. What's a sound wave in the first place? Sound waves are variations in air pressure that start from something that's vibrating. So something moves back and forth, like air going through your vocal cords, or hitting on a drum, or acoustic guitar strings swinging back and forth. Those variations in air pressure create a high pressure zone and a low pressure zone. And each one of those variations in air pressure is called a wave. Here's how we put it on a graph. We have our two axes, we have our zero line in the middle, we have positive air pressure over here, and negative air pressure over here our resting air molecules are right at zero. As an object vibrates and moves toward the air molecules, it causes the pressure to go up, and we draw it like this. Eventually, that swings back in the other direction, and the air molecules go back down in pressure back to our zero line. Then the object swings in the other direction, creating negative air pressure. We're gonna draw it like this. Eventually, it reaches the end of its travel, and it wants to return to the zero point. And now we've completed one cycle or one wave. How quickly this wave repeats is called its frequency or otherwise known as cycles per second. And we abbreviate that with the term Hertz or capital H lowercase z. You might've seen this on your EQ and that's because EQ is varying the levels of certain frequency ranges. So we try to identify which frequencies those are and adjust them up and down. The distance that it takes one wave to travel is called the wavelength, and that depends on the frequency and the velocity of sound. Although it does adjust for our barometric pressure, temperature, and humidity, a good average rule of thumb for the speed of sound is 1130 feet per second. Now, pure sine waves are pretty boring. When we hear a sound, and we hear the combination of the root note that an instrument is playing and its overtones, we call that combination of frequencies and the way the amplitude changes over time is timbre. It's spelled timber, but it's pronounced timbre. And I don't know why, the English language is just confusing. Although our sound sources are a combination of a bunch of different frequencies, we're just gonna look at one at a time to start so that we can understand phase and polarity. We're gonna divide up this sound wave into different sections of the wave because it's gonna behave with other sound waves depending on how they interact. Don't worry about all that yet. Let's just dive in. We're gonna take this entire wave and divide it into degrees. So here at the very beginning, we have zero degrees. And here at the end, we have zero again or 360 degrees. But it starts over, so it's the same thing. Right in the middle, we have 180 degrees. This is where the wave has completed the high pressure zone and is now moving into the low pressure zone. At the very top of the high pressure zone, we call that 90 degrees. And at the very bottom of the low pressure zone, we'll call that 270 degrees. All of this is pretty boring until we start to incorporate more than one sound wave at a time. When we have two sound waves of the same frequency that start and end at the same time, we'll get constructive interference. When we combine these two together, we get more amplitude both from the positive part and on the negative part of the sound wave. But if we have one sound wave that's going in the opposite direction, and they combine to meet in space, we'll get nothing. This part cancels out, and this part cancels out, leaving us with all our air molecules at rest. The thing is, this also happens when we have wiggling electrons that are representing air molecules. So when we have an analog audio signal, the same thing is gonna happen within our wires as it does in acoustic space. This is called destructive interference, or we're getting less amplitude from two waves that are going in opposite directions. These two waves are considered to be out of polarity from one another, or another way to say it is they are 180 degrees out of phase from each other. This line here of 180 is at the same point as this line here of zero. This timing difference can happen from two microphones that are on the same sound source, or if you're hearing both the direct sound source and a reflection of that sound source from that one frequency, if they arrive at different times, they can cancel each other out. 
Let's look at another way that this might happen with two different speakers. Let's imagine that we have two different speakers that are producing the exact same signal, but they're offset in distance from one another. I'm just drawing one and a half waves on the blue one so that you can see. But this one and this one are getting the exact same signal. If we overlaid these on top of each other, they would be identical. They're the same frequency and they're the same amplitude. But this one, because it's offset by distance, we have started the wave combining at a different phase. So this one, when it's starting its ascent or positive pressure, is starting at the same time when this wave is at its negative pressure. These two speakers are one half wavelength away from each other, and so they're combining to cancel out. If we moved this speaker so that it's at the same place in space as this speaker, then they would combine again, changing nothing about the audio signal. The other way that we could solve this problem is by flipping the polarity of one speaker. The polarity is the absolute push-pull of an audio signal. So usually when we have positive air pressure on a microphone, that diaphragm produces a positive voltage on pin two. That's a little bit more nerdy than you need to get to right now, but bear with me, it's not that complicated. When a speaker receives a positive amplified voltage on the positive terminal, it will create a push or create that compression. But if we flip the polarity so that the push-pull is reversed, we could take this and turn it into this. which would now line up in phase with the other speaker. The problem is that flipping the polarity on a speaker flips the polarity on all the frequencies. So while these frequencies might now be in phase, we've actually made other frequencies out of phase. That's why time alignment is really important in audio to get great results. And it clues you into the fact that we're not dealing with a single frequency at a time, we're dealing with lots of frequencies. So when we have a timing difference like this, there's a predictable pattern based on the delay or the time difference between the two sound sources that will create what's called comb filtering. If you looked at the frequency response graph for two different signals that are delayed, it will cancel out at certain frequencies and those frequencies get closer and closer together the higher up in the frequency spectrum that you go. Now let's talk about how it affects our microphone placement. And let's look at a snare drum as an example. If we take a snare drum and we put a poorly drawn microphone on the top, pointing down at the head, when the stick hits the drum head, it creates negative pressure initially reaching that drum mic. If we have another poorly drawn drum mic on the bottom, that stick hit creates positive pressure where it's moving air down toward that microphone. When the microphones combine electrically, one will be picking up the sound while it's pushing, and the other one will be picking up the sound while it's pulling. The resulting sound is actually thin, or it dumps out a bunch of low frequencies because those are the ones to cancel out easiest with a polarity reversal. So what's the solution? Well, you just hit the polarity button on your console. This flips the absolute push-pull for all the frequencies so that they're lining up better and you'll notice it most in the low end. So let's imagine we're listening on here. Uh, we've got our tracks coming in from a hard disk recorder because uh, I was shooting some other stuff for my broadcast audio course. But I thought I'd give you a demonstration of this as well. Uh, we've got the kick and the snare up. I've got the overheads down at the moment. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But let's listen to the snare drum and look at the polarity switches on there uh, and see if we need to flip the polarity switch or not. So it's definitely thicker when I don't flip the polarity. This must have been recorded or come to the console with the polarity flipped already. I think in this particular venue where this was recorded, they have a mic cable that's actually got its polarity flipped uh, on the leads of the mic cable for the snare bottom specifically so that we wouldn't have to flip the polarity everywhere. It would already be flipped 
wherever it needs to be. So that's one thing you're listening for when the snare gets thinner with the snare bottom, then flip the polarity. If it gets thicker when the polarity is not switched, leave it there. Again, you could use this as an effect to make it thinner and cut a little bit more, but I'd rather use my EQ and compression to make that happen. So if your snare is thin, flip the polarity on the bottom mic and then it will be thick again. Unless it's a piccolo snare and very thin in the first place, then it's just not gonna be very thick. But you should still flip the polarity anyway, because you gotta get at least some fundamental out of that drum. Now to continue our application with multiple microphones on a single sound source, and that's mostly the drums in live sound, let's take a look at the overheads with the close snare mic and see how polarity and phase work together and how understanding it is really gonna help you get better sounds. And that's really the whole idea. You just want to make stuff sound good. So let's say that we've got our overhead mics, our right overhead and our left overhead, and we've got a close mic on the snare. And I'm drawing my microphones as arrows because that's just easier to make it not look funky. So there's going to be a timing difference between these mics. So the snare drum hits here, it gets to this mic first, and it gets to this mic later. It also gets to this mic first and to this mic later. So we've got a timing issue unless we make sure that this mic and this mic are the same distance from the snare drum. Now, where do you measure exactly? Some people go from the center of the snare drum. Some people go from one of the lugs closest to the kick and the snare so that the kick and snare both are in the center of the stereo image for your overhead microphones. There's another video all about drum miking. I'll throw it down in the description if you want to check it out. Now, the tricky thing about a close mic and the overheads is that some of the frequencies are higher and they might arrive in phase with each other. But a different frequency might arrive out of phase between the two microphones. This is all well and good in theory, but what does it sound like in real life? Now let's look at the snare versus the overheads. As we play this, I'll blend in the overheads and we'll see if the snare gets thicker or thinner. So the snare seems to go up in pitch or tone when I'm hitting these polarity switches. So, you know, we're going to go for the thicker one. That's what I want. If I want it thinner again, that's fine too. The other solution for this, of course, is you can just take your high pass filter and crank it up and then it's not really going to matter what the polarity is all that much. But if you want to get low end out of your uh, overheads, these polarity switches do matter. Let's listen to that one more time. So you can do it whichever way you like, but that's one thing to pay attention to. Now with a bunch of different frequencies arriving at both of those microphones, you're going to be favoring some frequencies over other ones, or some are gonna cancel out and some are going to combine in constructive interference. Which one do you choose? Well, I always like to go with thicker because thicker is better. And you can always use the high pass filter to make it thinner again, but there's no amount of EQ that you can do to make something thicker if it's phase canceled between the two. The other option is to throw a high pass filter on the overhead so that they're just picking up the symbols, but that wouldn't be so fun for this demonstration. So that's another option. You can keep that in your back pocket. That one's for free. Stereo sound sources work because you have some signals that go to both speakers equally and it creates a phantom center channel or the stuff that's in the middle. Your ear perceives that it's in the middle because it's coming from both sides equally. If we polarity reverse one of the sides of that signal, it's going to make it so that all the stuff that's going to both of them equally cancels out and we're left with only the side information or it sounds kind of spacious and roomy, but it doesn't have the essence or the meat of what the input it really is. That can happen with electric guitars. If you've got a wet, dry, wet mix, and then that sums down to mono, or if you've got a stereo keyboard, one of the sides is flipped out of polarity. Suddenly the keyboard sounds very reverby. That's because all the stuff that's in both speakers has gotten canceled out. 
All right, here's a keyboard channel that's got piano and pads in both. I'm gonna flip the polarity on one side and then pop it into mono over here so that you can hear kind of what it feels like in both of those. In stereo with the polarity flipped, and mono with the one side's polarity flipped, and then back to normal again. All right, so when we flipped the polarity on one side and then kept it in stereo, it seemed a lot wider. You'll notice that too if you're listening in headphones or on stereo speakers. Uh, if you're listening on your phone right now, you probably didn't notice much of a change when we went to mono because you're probably already listening in mono or functionally mono, even if you've got two speakers on your phone. In mono, it got a lot thinner when we had one of the sides flipped. That's because everything that's in the center channel, including many of the low frequencies, are going to be canceling out when we flip one polarity switch on a stereo channel. The moral of this story is that if you're recording or something sounds distant, check the polarity or maybe one of your cables has been miswired so that it's flipping the polarity on one side of the signal, but not the other. Now in real world application, the polarity switch matters very little on most mono inputs, except maybe the kick drum. That's where it really does matter. I really like to feel the thump in my chest and that Initial compression makes a difference to me. If you disagree, you can let me know down in the comment. Another place where it does matter is if you've got a singer in in-ear monitors. Sometimes flipping the polarity on that can help them with their inner hum. If you want more information on that, I've got a video down in the description below. As a takeaway, here are four things that you need to be able to listen for and identify with your audio engineering ear training. The first is the sound of a snare drum with a top and bottom mic or the bottom mic's polarity is not flipped. The second one is the sound of the snare drum getting thinner when you mix in the overheads. The third is a stereo source where one side's polarity has been flipped, and you'll need to listen to this both in mono and in stereo. The fourth one is the sound of comb filtering, two identical signals arriving at different times and canceling certain frequencies out. Sometimes you can notice this if you're watching the news and the news anchor moves their hands or something in front of their microphone, you can hear those reflections and how it changes the tone. Now that you've got your homework, go ahead and mash that like button and hit subscribe. Remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.